Eh, ahorita tenemos el, el gusto de tener a, a Gary Cockins. Gary, eh, él va a ser el keynote, el último keynote de la conferencia. Él es un experto orador, es un speaker profesional. Eh, de hecho, me impresionó cuando nos mandamos y me mandó el listado de todas las, las prácticas diferentes que daba para que nosotros eligiéramos, algo eh, muy, muy, muy nítido. Él es, eh, tiene su licenciatura y su maestría de la Universidad de Cornell, una de las mejores universidades en ingeniería industrial. Están, eso me estábamos hablando, creo que está el número cuatro ahorita del mundo. Eh, fue deportista destacado en el fútbol universitario. Eh, también tiene su MBA de nuevo de, 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 de la Escuela de Administración de Kellogg en Northwestern. Es eh, miembro de la Junta de Asesores de la Escuela de Negocios de Harvard. Eh, es una persona muy conocida, y hablábamos que hasta está en el Hall of Fame de, de, de béisbol hace un ratito. Él les contará un poquito más. Y él mismo tiene una pequeña presentación para poder comentarles quién es él. Entonces, sin más, eh, Gary, thank you very much for being here. <coughs> uh, we highly appreciate it. And uh, uh, please, you can go ahead with your talk. Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. And, you know, having a industrial engineering and operations research degree. It's always fun to talk to basically family. We're like friends. So um, because there may not be enough time to answer all questions at the end, your options are you can directly email me. So write down my email address, gcokins at garycokins.com. You can also send messages or questions to Jorge or Jose. They'll put it in a Word document, send it to me. I'll try to answer them in 48 hours. Um, but let's get going. Oh, and in my website, across the horizontal tabs are a lot of free downloadable articles. They're in English you know, can educate you. So let's get going. So a little bit more, who am I? Yes, I did graduate in 1971. So if you're doing the math, I'm 72 years old, but I feel like I'm 42 years old. Um, my employment was 10 years in industry, large manufacturer in the United States, FMC Corporation, then 15 years of consulting with Deloitte, KPMG, and then electronic data systems. And then up till eight years ago, I was 16 years with SAS. And many of you will recognize SAS's name. It's the world's largest privately owned software vendor, 15,000 employees. You know, data science analytics is the specialty. I was raised in Chicago. Go Cubs, go Bears. Those are sports teams in Chicago. So let's go because I got to go fast. A lot of material to cover. Who will benefit from this presentation? Managers who have previously struggled at promoting financial planning and analysis, enterprise performance management, and integrating business analytics into their decision support systems. Managers who intend to champion any or all EPM and business analytics improvement techniques, and they need a compelling call to action. The reason I have champion in quotation marks is because it's been my observation, although it's nice to have senior leadership and executives sponsor new initiatives, Often they're preoccupied with firefighting and short-term priorities is typically managers one, two, three levels down in the organization chart who are passionate and ask themselves, how long do we want our organization to continue to use stale or arcane methods? And they're the ones that will do a pilot or a project or a proof of concept or a rapid prototype to demonstrate to their coworkers and executives, this is the way to go. So if you're many levels on the organization chart, that's fine. I like presenting to you. So I'm going to briefly explain is what is the confusion, the lack of consensus about enterprise performance, briefly about business analytics. Then I'm going to talk about eight pressures that have caused interest in it. And then I'm going to drill down the rest of the presentation into several of those pressures. And then I'll bring it all together at the end. So there is confusion, a lack of consensus about an enterprise performance management. Is it human resources performance management? If you just do a search on the two words performance management, they'll all be, you know, personnel and HR, like employee appraisals. It's much broader than that. Is it scorecards, dashboards, key performance indicators and measures, as well as aligning the managers with the strategy of the executives? Yes, but that's a subset. Is it about process? productivity and quality improvement? Yes, 
But that's also a subset. That's business process management, you know, lean management, cycle time reduction, quality improvement. It's a subset. Or is it all of the above and even more? And it is. And the good news is this. Enterprise performance management to many is not something new you have to learn about. You've probably read about it in magazines, but you may not have implemented in your company. But those who have implemented, the problem is they implement these methods in isolation of each other. So you got profit analysis and pricing people in one part of the building. You got process improvement in another part of the building, risk management people in another part of the building, budgeting people in another part of the building. You get a lot more power and synergy. Look at my fingers when you integrate them like gears in a machine. And even more power when you embed analytics of all flavors into them. So the definition I just gave you, since you'll get a PDF of these slides, it's the integration, multiple methodologies, each embedded with business analytics like segmentation, especially predictive analytics. And the purpose of all of it is to achieve the strategy the executives make better decisions. Let's briefly talk about analytics, insights and actions. Queries simply answer questions. What business analytics does is it creates questions. Further business analytics then stimulate more questions, more complex questions, more interesting questions. And most importantly, business analytics has the power to answer the questions. And I'm going to get a little serious here, although some of you may think you are serious. No, I'm a pretty funny guy. I believe in the past, the best executives and leaders had the best answers. Today, I do not think that's the case. Today, I think the best leaders and best executives have the best questions. There's too much complexity. There's too much volatility. There's too much uncertainty for them to rely on their gut feel or intuition or the types of answers they had earlier in their career that got them promoted to the high positions. They need to create a culture of investigation and discovery and tolerance for making mistakes as long as you learn from the mistakes. Now, here's a whole list of domains where analytics applies. I don't have enough time to go through all of them and I just wanna show you analytics, data science is pervasive everywhere. But I want to contrast business intelligence with business analytics. Business analytics is actually a stage of high, higher. Business intelligence are these four, standard reports, ad hoc reports, query, drill down, you know, like online analytical processing, typical vendors there, Click, Tableau, Microsoft Power BI, SaaS, and alerts. You react to that information. What business and, and, and analysis is, is much higher statistical analysis, regression, correlation, clustering, association. You know, many regular people took those courses in college. They just wanted to get a passing grade and get the heck out of there. Well, I tell them, sorry, it's here. But the good news is you don't need to get your textbooks out of your attic or basement, but you need skill sets like operations research people in your organization to basically apply analytics. Then we move to forecasting, predictive modeling, and I call it Mount Everest, the tallest mountain in the world, optimization. So let's now talk about enterprise performance management. I'm gonna take three or four minutes and describe, these are eight reasons that people are now is interested in it. And then I will go into detail in three or four of them. One, executive frustration with strategy failure. Most executives are pretty good at formulating the strategy. Their frustration is failure to execute the strategy. And there's empirical evidence on this. There's an executive recruiting firm in Chicago that monitors the turnover, firings, terminations of CEOs in North America. It is increasing every year. Good example is Carly Fiorini at Hewlett Packard. The board of directors gave her time to execute the strategy. She failed, they fired her. Number two, increased accountability. Today, there is no place to hide. Managers and employees will be monitored. They will be measured. It doesn't necessarily mean their job's at risk, but it could adversely impact their salary increases or job promotions. Three, more rapid decision-making. Unlike many months ago, you could have meetings with conference room, you know, test and learn. Today, people are on the phone. Go or no go, yes or no. They need to make the decision in real time. Four, 
mistrust of the management accounting system for transparency and accuracy. The truth is most managers do not trust the management accounting system. And we'll talk about that. They hate those overhead allocations. Five, poor customer value management. The reality is customers are the source of value creation, financial value creation for shareholders and owners. The problem is most customers view their suppliers as commodities. Therefore, for a supplier to be competitive, they need to provide differentiated services to different segments of customers. Not all of them are doing it well. Six, contentious budgeting, poor resource capacity planning. This may surprise you. I think the annual budgeting process is so broken that my advice is stop budgeting. I probably caught your attention, but that begs the question, what was the purpose of a budget in the first place and can we replicate it? Seven, dysfunctional supply chain management. The problem there is most, most customers view their suppliers as the enemy. That's got to stop. Supply chains are competing against other supply chains. It needs to be a marriage. The trading partners in the supply chain need to basically work together to understand and identify mutually beneficial projects and initiatives. And finally, number eight, unfulfilled return on investment promises from large IT systems like enterprise resource planning, ERP systems. And the issue there is, if you ask a chief information officer, an IT director, three years after they've taken the big effort to implement the ERP system, you ask them, how well do you believe the return on investment met or exceeded what the ERP software salesman sold you on three years ago? They'll be hard pressed to say yes. We put in a lot of work to implement this. I'm not sure we've got the payback. That does not mean you should implement the ERP system. You must implement them to remain competitive. The problem is they produce a lot of data, but not the information. And what the EPM methods do is it creates the information, it creates the ROI, like releasing seeds from the ground. So for the next, what, 45 minutes, I'm going to about drill into these four of the eight forces. Let's start with strategy. The issue here is that Professor Robert S. Kaplan, Harvard Business School, and Dr. David Norton created a method called the balanced scorecard. You'll notice in this slide, the strategy map goes into it. I'll describe that in a minute. Above that, though, is something more important. It's the vision and mission statement. That must come from the executives. That's their job. They need to answer the question, where do we want to go? But what the strategy map and balanced scorecard answer is a better question. How will we get there? What are the projects or initiatives to accomplish the objectives? What core processes must we improve? The strategy map and the scorecard, they're mechanical. They're one of those many gears of all of the EPM methods. They help realize the vision and mission. Now, very briefly, this is a generic picture of what Kaplan and Norton created. This is a strategy map. They realized that executives were overreacting to financial results reported at the end of the period. They said, you need to shift your attention to measures reported during the period so you can react to them. They created these four perspectives that have cause and effect relationship from bottom to top. Each of the rectangles in the perspective is a strategic objective. So when we start at the bottom, if the managers are accomplishing the learning and innovation objectives, they'll contribute to the internal process improvement objectives. If they're accomplishing those, they'll contribute to the customer retention and growth perspectives. If they're accomplishing all of them upward, they'll accomplish the financial objectives. Those arrows, those are measures. We call them key performance indicators, KPIs. You know, you get what you measure. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. If you can't manage it, you can't improve it. Now, many organizations that have put in a strategy map and scorecard have way too many KPIs. You ask them, oh, you got a balanced scorecard. How many KPIs? They 300. That's wonderful. How can they all be a key, a K? Quickly, here's the difference between KPIs and operational PIs. They're all measures. They're all important. They just serve different purposes. <clears throat> KPIs are strategic. PIs are operational. 
KPIs must have targets. It's like a carrot in front of a mule or donkey because it- I think something happened. Yeah, Gary froze. Eh, se, se le trabó un poquito la señal. Vamos a esperar un ratito a ver qué, qué pasó. Se mira todo smooth. Vamos a esperar un ratito. Aquí tengo la presentación de él, pero creo que no, no es el punto. Vamos a, a darle un minuto. Mientras tanto, no sé si ya se registraron para la conferencia. Para que lo hagan de una vez. Aquí aprovechamos para la conferencia, perdón, para la rifa. Perdón. Eh, para que se puedan registrar de una vez. No sé si falta alguno. Ahorita. Did I get knocked off? Yeah, you did. Oh, wow. Well, I looked at my wireless. I'm on, so it must have been Zoom knocked me off. All right, yeah, let's. Probably. So, uh, can you share your screen again, please? Yeah, 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 yeah. Doing it. Oh, we got to move fast. All right, that's where I left off. Okay. okay. So, Christian, can we switch back to Gary, please? Okay, that was a good recovery. Have you yeah. switched me back? Ready? Hey, Christian. I don't, I don't think you're back. Oh, can you share your screen, please? I have. You have? Okay. Uh, I, there you go. You are up? Yeah, but can they see my screen? Yes. They, there they, it is. They. Okay. All right. I got to go even faster now. So <laughs> KPIs must have targets. Those are set by the, by the executives. But in contrast, performance indicators, they don't need targets. They can have them, but they could be like trend analysis, up or lower round thresholds. Next, frequency of reporting, monthly, quarterly, you know, that's strategic. Once we get into weekly or daily, we're no longer strategic, we're operational. Next, the KPIs must be derived from the strategy map. You tailor them like a men or woman's suit of clothes. Next, there should be two types of KPIs, process-based and project-based. Examples of project-based, percentage of completion of the project, milestones in the project. Why projects? Because strategy is about change. It's not about doing the same things over and over again a little bit better. And you make change with projects. And then we have an issue that the budget is typically disconnected from the strategy. I'll talk about that later. Incidentally, a very fast way to implement these methods, a technique I use is called rapid prototyping. And in case any of the attendees are consultants, contact me and I can train you how to implement these. And Jorge, you and Jose as well. It starts with a one-day workshop and it basically leverages strength, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. We call it SWAT. So you see those three pictures at the bottom. The night before the meeting with the executives, I tell them, fill out 20 yellow Post-its. When they come in, I now have the four perspectives from left to right, learning and growth, process, customer, financial. I say, put your yellow post-its on the wall under those four, easy to do. The next step, look at the middle photograph. I tell them for, for the next 30 minutes, look at what other people have written on their post-its and move them because they have stickies to ones that are similar. And within 45 minutes, Look at those clusters, the white sheets of paper. We now have the strategic objectives. Now look at the photograph at the right. In the meeting for the next few hours, we say for each of those objectives, what would be a project or initiative? Next, what would be one or two key performance indicators? So by three o'clock at the end of the day, they have a strategy map and a balanced scorecard. <clears throat> It's not perfect. They went through it quickly. What I tell them next to do, even though they could do it again the next day slower, delegate it to their line managers. Give them the strategic objectives. Let them identify the projects. Let them identify the KPIs. Why delegate it to the managers? Because you're going to now educate them. You're going to communicate the strategy to them. Many don't know the strategy. And more importantly, they selected the KPIs They're going to be held accountable, so they're going to have some buy-in. All right, I got to move faster. Next, mistrust of the management accounting system and its flawed cost allocations. Here's the problem. Most managers do not like the cost allocations by the accountants. 
They feel it's unfair to them. They feel they're being charged for something that they didn't cause, but other departments did. Activity-based costing resolves this. So here's a quick explanation of what is ABC. Imagine you go to a restaurant with three other friends. You order a little salad and the other three order the most expensive item on the menu. And at the end of the meal, when the waiter or waitress brings the bill, the other three say, hey, let's split this check evenly. How do you feel? Not fair, not equitable. <clears throat> well, that's how products and standard service lines and service organizations also feel. When the accountants take this large amount of indirect expense, commonly called overhead, and they allocate it to the products and service lines, like spreading butter across bread. They use factors like number of labor hours, number of units produced, number of items delivered, square feet, square meters, headcount, full-time equivalents. None of those cost allocation factors reflect the unique consumption that the diverse products and services consumed are the end-to-end -end business processes and the work activities that belong to them. So if you were to decompose the indirect overhead expenses into multiple cost pools and trace and assign them with a cause and effect relationship, you will discover compared to the traditional standard costing, in reality, some of the products were overcosted, the others must be undercosted because it's a zero-sum error game. That means that the accountants are providing flawed and misleading information to their managers. Yes, it does reconcile in total and exactly for the audit for financial accounting to the government agencies, but it's wrong in the parts for management accounting. Now, the problem actually begins with the responsibility cost center statement to the left. Every manager on the planet Earth recognizes this statement. But when the manager gets this report, they ask themselves, how much insight and understanding do I get about the costs that I influence and control? And their answer is not much. Whoop. I typically say when they receive that report, they're either happy or sad, but they're rarely any smarter. And it's not that the report's bad, it's just that the data there is not structured they can basically calculate the cost. So notice in the middle, we translate the same 914,000 into the language of work. It's the same amount of money. Key scan claims, analyze claims. Notice I'm using the back office of an insurance company. It's a factory too. And then we reassign the activity costs into the products and service lines, channels, customers, just like the waiter and the waitress with four individual checks. Now, it's a lot more complex than I just described. And I won't go into detail on this, but you can basically go to my website, download under one of the tabs. It's an Institute of Management Accounting, Statement of Management Accounting. Its title is Implementing ABC. But very quickly, it has the three universal components of any organization's expense and cost structure. The resource expenses at the top, the work activities in the middle, and then they pile up in the bottom into the product services and customers in business sustaining. The bottom module, think of it like the predator food chain. You know, large mammals eat small mammals, small mammals eat plants. So we accumulate all of the costs, they eventually accumulate into the customers and business sustaining. Business sustaining is a special category. Not all expenses basically make products or interact with customers, things like the legal department. So we create a, a cost object there like senior management or board of directors. You still need to recover those expenses. They could be 10 to 15% and monthly. You still have to recover them to be profitable. They just can't be allocated. The pipes, the arrows, think of them as thin straws or wide pipes, where the diameter reflects the amount of money going through. The message here is costing is modeling. It's not accounting, general ledger, T accounts, and journal entries. Direct cost, not broken. You may have data integrity issues. You can fix that. If you want to know more detail about what those two slides, when you get this PDF, 
click on the link in this slide. It's a 30 page paper. You can read it at your leisure. All right, the result of ABC. The vertical axis is the magnitude of the error compared to the traditional costing. So the horizontal line would be the butter spreading standard costing. The curvy line is the cost you calculate with ABC. So notice to the left, the simple products have actually been overcosted by traditional. They're like you in the restaurant ordering the little salad. They're subsidizing the others. The ones on the right, though, the complex products have been undercosted. So they're actually, you're losing money, but you didn't think it. The problem is this, to the left, since you think you're losing money and you raised your price, competitors can price 5 10% below you and steal your business. On the complex products, the sales force will start selling more and more of products in reality are unprofitable. So the more they sell, the more you lose money. This is important. This is the result of what you see when you use ABC. We refer to this profit, this graph as a whale curve because it looks like a humpback whale. The vertical axis is the net revenues minus the properly calculated and traced ABC costs. The horizontal axis is the cumulative buildup of the profit, but it is rank ordered from the most profitable product to the second most profitable product and so forth. The very last data point at the right will exactly reconcile with the profit and loss statement. What you're looking at is real data from a folding chair company in the United States. So in this company, they had 30 million in sales for the quarter, 28 in expense to net out a two, and the last data point is two. There's always organization shock when management sees this graph, because in this case, it said, look, you made roughly $8 million on three-fourths of your most profitable products. You lost $6 million on the remainder. But their belief system is this graph was this blue line. And that's because all that butter spreading, those broad averages of those cost allocations was crushing any accuracy. And the ABC multi-stage cost assignment network, the model was detecting the diversity and variation. So the top line is the truth. The blue line is false. Some of you may say, what about all those unprofitable products on the right? Should you drop or abandon them? No, that could be a mistake because some companies deliberately will have what are called loss leaders. They'll price them a little lower than the cost because they're associated with winners. Blades and razors is an example. They'll sell the razor blade for shaving at a loss, but they'll make up the money with the blades. The point is the top line is fact-based data. And if you remember anything from this presentation, remember this, in the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one. In the absence of facts, anybody's opinion is a good one. But usually the biggest opinion wins, which is the opinion of the boss or the boss of the boss. So to the degree they're making decisions on gut feel or intuition, the organization's at risk. All right, let's move on to the next force, moving from being product-centric to customer-centric. The value of a company is a function of the value from its customers. The only value a company will ever create is the value that comes from its customers, the current ones and the new ones acquired in the future. To remain competitive, one must determine how to keep customers longer, grow them into bigger customers, make them more profitable, serve them more efficiently, and acquire relatively more profitable customers like your existing profitable customers. But we have a couple of problems here. One, the accountants are not measuring customer profitability. They're stopping halfway only at the product gross profit margin line. Visually, what I'm saying is if the entire rectangle was your total expenses, the accountants are only calculating costs and margins for the shaded area. And I'm going to make a case that the white space, distribution, sales, marketing, is more important. So why is it more important? Four reasons. One, customer retention versus acquisition costs. It's much more expensive to acquire a new customer than to retain an existing one. And if you know about decision theory, when you have sunk costs and in ex existing customers, you already have them. So the sunk cost, you don't include sunk or fixed costs in future decisions. Next, sources of competitive advantage. 
commoditization leading to service differentiation. As I mentioned earlier, customers view suppliers as commodities. Therefore, for a supplier to be competitive, they need to provide differentiated services to different segments of customers. They're not all doing it well. Next, from mass selling to -to one-to-one customer relationship. The message here is the marketing and salespeople need to work backwards knowing the unique preferences and tastes and characteristics of customers and tailor the offers, deals, price discounts to those customers. And finally, the internet's irreversible shift of power from sellers to buyers. It is shifting. And I don't mean just you and your family purchasing items on the internet. Today, a purchasing agent in a company with a click of a mouse can see 10 suppliers and all of the information about them. And this is an event, the internet is happening in our lifetime. So if you look at those four forces, we need to know much more about selling distribution marketing expenses. Now we have another problem, angel customers and demon customers. What do I mean by this? Every company has high and low maintenance customers. High maintenance customers, those are the demons. Examples are, always changing delivery schedules, always demanding special, not standard products, always returning goods, always calling help desk. Low maintenance customers, the angels, we love them. Why? They only buy standard, never change schedule, never call help desk, never return goods. If those two types of customers at the extreme, but the same volume, same mix at the same price, they're not equally profitable because the high maintenance customer is causing you so much extra cost that they're eroding the profit. But what really caught my attention was of this book was not the main title, but the subtitle, Discover Which Type of Customer is Which and Turbocharger Stock Price. What this means is we, want, we need to trace customer value creation to shareholder and owner wealth creation. With ABC and the Multistage Cost Assignment Network, you can create a profit and loss statement for each customer and the profit margins will be layered like an onion skin, layer by layer by layer. And in this fictitious example, notice this customer had a 30% composite average gross profit margin from all the different products they bought, some above 30, some below 30. But between the 30 and the eight, 22 more points of profit are lost Nothing to do with making the product or delivering the standard service, all with distribution, marketing, selling, customer service. So if you calculate this for every single customer, we can put them into a chart that looks like this. Each customer is a circle intersection. The vertical axis is the product mix gross profit margin. You remember above the line, the horizontal axis is the cost to serve below the line, selling, marketing with the angels on the left and the devils on the right. Now things become obvious. The most unprofitable customers are on the bottom right because they're buying low profit margin mix from you and they're difficult to serve. The most profitable customers are on the upper left of the grid because they're buying high margin mix from you and they're easy to serve. And now the name of the game is move the dots from the bottom right to the upper left. But that's for the marketing and salespeople to do. But at least we need to provide them the information to know where are the dots. And one example that they might do to move the dots would be fee-based. You know, charge them a fee for the extra services. In the U.S., banks have been doing that with depository accounts. Airlines now charge for baggage or to shift from a middle seat to an aisle or an exit seat. Some of you may be saying maybe we should be doing activity-based costing at our company. But it would be a much slighted data. There'd be 3,000 activities in it. Every employee would have to fill out a timesheet, and employees hate timesheets. IT would have to extract data from the, from the ERP system. All of those are misconceptions. But the problem is that's what people believed in the last 5, 10, 20 years. And as a result, ABC failed. It was too complex, too large, unsustainable. I then came up with a model, a technique called rapid prototyping again with iteratory modeling. I get a one-day workshop, five, six cross-functional employees in a room, build a very fast, high-level ABC model. Its intent is not to be accurate. Then bring in the managers 
the second day, they look at it, very engaging. It's their own company. The light bulbs go on with everybody. Oh, that's how we get replaced that butter spreading allocations. Oh, that's how we can validate our pricing and our profit margins and so forth. Then we do a couple of iterations for a couple of weeks. Within three weeks, permanent repeatable production system, not six months, not a year. Make your mistakes early and often, not later when the system is too hard to change. The reason rapid prototyping works has to do with this diagram. The vertical axis is the accuracy of what you may want to know. Like, I want to know the true, accurate, reasonably accurate product cost or service line cost. The horizontal axis is the level of administrative effort to collect the data, validate the data, calculate the data, report the data. Notice you will always get an asymptotic curve, meaning the accuracy goes up very quickly, hits that elbow, and then to the right, you get diminishing returns on extra accuracy for the extra level of effort of work. So stop at 95%, good enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. This is management accounting, not external financial reporting. For external financial reporting, if the accountants get the numbers wrong, they go to jail. But with management accounting, if you get the numbers wrong, you don't go to jail, you know? So just get it good enough. I love this cartoon. Notice the answer sideboard. To the left, the sign says simple but wrong. To the right, complex but right. Look at how many are going the simple but wrong. That's all the accountants. It's terrible. They're being irresponsible. We've got to tell the accountants, you need to be more responsive and take the right path. Basically do activity-based costing, give better numbers to your managers. All right, moving faster. The budget. Budget is a problem. The budget is typically a fiscal exercise done by the accountants that has two problems. One, it's disconnected from the executive team strategy. Two, it's not based on future driver volumes. So a way to basically replace the budget is through thinking through two river streams coming at the organization. But before I describe them, let me describe how most organizations do their budget. See if you can relate to this. You give every manager a spreadsheet for their department. They fill it out for every expense account, including rubber bands from January to, to December. Someone in the accounting department then consolidates the spreadsheet. You bring in the forecast, the revenues from the sales. You give it to the management executive team. They look at the number, not good enough. They want more profit. Go change some of the spreadsheets. Every manager then reduces some of the spreadsheets. Back to the consolidation, back to the managers at the top. That's better, not good enough. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Golly, you almost want to ask the executives, what number did you want in the first place? That would save us all of this time of revising the spreadsheets. And there's a lot of jokes about the annual budget. It's out of date a couple of months after you publish it. It caves into the loudest voice and strongest muscle of the veteran sandbaggers, you know, who know how to sandbag and pad their budget. What bothers me the most is when a manager is three, four months from the end of the fiscal year and they can see they're not going to have spent all the budget that was approved for them, what do they start doing? They start spending needlessly, foolishly. Why? Because they know that the next year's budget is going to be pegged to the baseline of what they spent this year. We call it use it or lose it spending. So how do we fix this? Think about the amount of spending is a result of two river streams coming at you. Look at the upper river stream. That's the recurring repeatable work. It's demand-driven, customer demand. The bottom river stream is the non-recurring, non-repeatable work that comes from projects. So quickly, for the upper river stream, the way to basically, and this is going to have to be fast, is if you calculate your ABC model backwards, meaning you forecast the volume and mix, and you use calibrated cost consumption rates that were calibrated from the past year, to solve for the level of capacity. I think it was my second semester freshman year at Cornell University Industrial Engineering. We all know the equation, volume and mix times unit level cost consumption rates equals capacity required. Number and type of employees with their salary and wages and spending with um, suppliers. For the So that's the top river stream. For the bottom river stream, 
we go to the strategy map. We like we look at what the projects are to accomplish those objectives. We fund them. Now we've connected strategy to the budget. We go to risk mitigation, and that's a whole other story. But the enterprise risk management community will identify types of risk events that can occur in the future. We basically figure out what of those can we spend money to mitigate the risk. And then there's capital projects. You're all familiar with capital projects. So that's going to be much better than those spreadsheets up, down, up, down. I will warn you, the next slide is a little more complex. I've decomposed the previous slide very quickly. And you'll get these slides in the PDF. You can look at these slowly. But let me just show you at the bottom right, shaded. well, the shaded upper river stream are the four shaded boxes. The ones to the left are the lower river stream. Look at the bottom box shaded box. It says derived budget. The input to that is coming from the forecast of the volume and mix times the unit consumption rates. It gives us the capacity resource plan, number of labor hours, number of pounds or kilograms, number of employees. We monetize that. That's a good number. Notice to the left, capital budget, strategy budget, risk budget. I described quickly how they can be derived. That is going to be a much better number than those spreadsheets. But we will still have the same problem. Once we derive all those numbers and we give it the executive, see the acceptable? There may not be enough profit there. They may, not, they may want more profit. Okay, we got to change something. The temptation might be, why don't we eliminate or postpone capital projects? Why don't we eliminate or postpone strategy projects? Why don't we eliminate or postpone risk projects? Eh, all bad, all bad. Because then we're going to jeopardize implementing the projects. We're going to jeopardize our strategy. There is one lever in this diagram that you can change to lower the cost. It's unit level consumption rates, productivity, process improvement. And that's where industrial engineers and operations research people come in. Cycle time reduction, quality improvement. Lean management, 2%, 4%, 6% productivity improvement in the future year. But things get tricky because when we're looking descriptive, we don't care about whether our expenses sunk, fixed, step fixed, or variable. But when we go to the predictive view for any decisions, we have to classify the resource behavior as sunk, fixed, step fixed, or variable. And the issue here is the classification of each resource depends on the planning horizon. So in the very short term, one day, one week, you can't quickly adjust capacity up or down. But as we go out months, quarters, we can replace full-time employees with temporary contractors. We can lease assets that we would have bought that would have been fixed. So you've got to think like an engineer. I always tell the accountants, I speak at a lot of accounting conferences, you know, I'm an engineer masquerading as an accountant. That's why I like presenting to all of you. You will think the right way. All right, let's bring it all together. How do all these pieces fit together? This diagram, think of this like the circulatory system in your body, your heart, and then your blood flowing through your veins. All right, the big purple box at the bottom, that's your organization. That's all your employees. That's all of your assets, okay? I'll show you how these things, these circular things flow. But we, what we want to ultimately do is connect customers to shareholders. See how I connected that line? We Customer retention, growth, loyalty to shareholders. Remember earlier I said customers are the source of value creation for financial wealth creation of shareholders and owners. Where's management accounting and analytics in the diagram? I didn't put it in there. Why? Because the output of management accounting and analytics is the input to so many different places. It's pervasive. Okay. How does the diagram work? We start with the customers. The strategy and mission will be defined by the executives. Remember, that's their job. Once they formulate the strategy, They'll then communicate it to the employees with the scorecards and dashboards with key performance indicators. Then with key performance indicators, if every employee every morning turns on their computer screen 
they can look at their maybe two, three or four dials and they can see is the dial favorable or unfavorable to the target. What that really means is every employee every day can answer this one question. How am I doing on what is important? I'll repeat that. They can answer, how am I doing on what's important? And if every employee in the company can answer that, then how are we doing on what's important? So that's the whole strategy management execution. Now comes targeting. Remember the customer profitability reporting. The question that sales and marketing is always asking, which type of customer is most attractive to retain, to grow, to win back and acquire? Which types are not attractive? And for the attractive ones, how much should we optimally spend growing, retaining, acquiring them, price discounts, coupons, deals, offers? So that connects the sales and marketing department with the customers. Now comes the area that many of you listening to me are familiar with. It's the process improvement. It's the productivity. It's the enterprise resource planning. You know, there's the... When we think about end-to-end business processes, you know, think of them with swim lanes and value-added, non-value-added scoring and tagging. The most universal, dominant end-to-end business process is order fulfillment. Take the customer order, complete the order. You know, admit the hospital patient, heal the patient. So that's the world of lean management, Six Sigma. And so, if we if Ultimately, though, what this really means is shareholder wealth creation is not the the goal. It's really the result. Now, notice this. This is happening every minute, hour, day, week, month, year. These are the veins that are flowing through. But if any of these veins are constricted, I call it, there's there's a medical term, arteriosclerosis for a heart attack, This is arteriosclerosis of the veins. If any of those veins is restricted, then look at what happens. It leaks. The money doesn't go to the shareholders or owners. It leaks into the sewer. So the message here, think of this as the vision of what you want to have. You want all these veins to be flowing. And the executives have to basically play a role in this. They have to prioritize which ones of the methods do we do. If managers don't understand the strategy, then let's basically do the strategy at balance scorecard. If we don't know where we make or lose money, where our profits are, or which customers are more or less profitable, then do ABC. If we need to do process improvement, then let's do lean management Six Sigma. But my message is don't take two years, four years to do these. Do rapid prototyping. Put these methods in, you can do them in just a few months so that you basically optimize. Now comes my frustration. Why has the adoption rate for all these methods been so slow? I'm going to describe three barriers, then we can get to some question and answer. The first barrier is technical barriers. It includes IT-related issues, dirty data, low-quality data. But the IT department has a tool called Extraction, Transform, and Load, ETL. It'll purify the data. The next barrier is the perception of excess complexity and affordability. In other words, the managers and executives think, oh, strategy map, it's too difficult. Oh, activity-based costing, it's too complicated. It, it's not worth the effort. We, would, it won't, we won't get the payback. Wrong. I demonstrated to you already in this presentation, you can build a strategy map with a balanced scorecard in one day. You can build an activity-based costing system that's reasonably good enough in three weeks. The real barriers got nothing to do with technology, methods, or software. It's all about people. It's organizational behavior barriers. It involves resistance to change, culture, and leadership. Let's start with resistance to change. It's human nature. People like the status quo. Only babies like change, you know, change their diapers. Next, fear of others knowing, fear of knowing the truth or other departments knowing the truth. Oh, I don't want the other department to know what my costs are. Oh, I don't want to know that my profit margins for my product I'm responsible for are really lower than what's being reported. Next, fear of being measured. Next, 
fear of being held accountable. Finally, weak leadership. There, I said it. Not every leadership team has got the highest IQ. So the point here is if you want to get buy-in to implement these methods, you've got to have some change management skills. And most of you don't have degrees in sociology or psychology. You're like me. We are all Newtonians. Like, you know, the physicist Isaiah Newton. You know, to us, the world's a big machine. Give us the levers, pulleys, dials. We need to be more like Charles Darwin. You know, it's an organism. Sense and respond. You're going to have to learn how to get buy-in and overcome resistance to change in people. I'm going to skip these six takeaways. They would just be a recap of my presentation. That'll give us, well, let me read them real quickly. We'll, we'll still have eight minutes. Takeaways from this presentation, enterprise preparedness management, it's not a process. It's the integration of many management methods. Each EPM method can be enhanced with embedded business analytics. I didn't give you examples. There wasn't enough time, but you can do correlation analysis to test the quality of KPIs in a strategy map. You can do correlation analysis to test the quality of the activity drivers in an ABC system. You can do segmentation analysis. Three, the purpose of business analytics is to gain insights and foresight to make better decisions. No argument. Next, having competencies and skills with business analytics is arguably more valuable than having a good strategy. Strategy can be vulnerable. Finally, overcoming people challenges, that's the resistance to change, is essential to apply business analytics and to integrate them. The IT department can be also a challenge, and that's a whole other story. And finally, customers are the source of shareholder and owner financial value, hence understanding the profit and loss by each customer, including non-product costs like distribution, selling, marketing, generates questions and needed conversations to increase profitability. So to conclude, action steps, get educated. Thank you. You're doing that by listening to this webinar. Get buy-in from people that are rapid prototyping, start small, think big, and improve the incentives. I have left two links there under the resources. One is a five-minute read that, believe it or not, summarizes this presentation. The second one is 30 pages. So to conclude, make what I call make the complete vision of performance management, the left page is a cover of my book, Greasy, Grimy, Broken Gears. That doesn't work very well. Look at the right, titanium gears, spinning faster revolutions per minute. Make the revolutions per minute of the CPM business analytics gear spin better, faster, cheaper. That's the process improvement, safer, risk management, smarter. Your success depends on how well and right information gets the right people. Okay, Jorge, we still have, I guess, eight minutes. That was like an MBA in one hour. <laughs> Wasn't that amazing? <laughs> wow, thank you very much, uh, Gary. I know how difficult it sometimes is to present in such a short time so many things, right? Uh, I, I always tell my students, you know, that I like to invite people over and do talks because talks are like a small uh, abstract of a whole bunch of years. You know, so it's uh, it's amazing, and what you just did is amazing, amazing talk, amazing advices. I think they they should have taken a, the audience should have taken a, probably a lot of advantage out of this talk. As we talked at the beginning, I'm gonna share uh, send you an email over with uh, uh, questions, and uh, so so. Uh, but we have probably uh, let me see. Yeah, everybody was asking for the link and your website, and we already shared that to them. Uh, we're gonna also uh, uh, send them uh, the PDF of your presentation. Yeah, uh, I think it's a lot of uh, a lot a lot to grasp out of the presentation. Oh, yes. So, yeah, I would recommend the audience just to look through the video and uh, try to you know just chew it slower. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, too much too much content. Uh, a lot of things to to say and a lot of other life advices, I would say. So yes, well, Gary, thank you very much. Uh, I don't know if you want to say something let, else. Let me make a suggestion: when you distribute 
to the attendees, go to my PowerPoint, the last slide, the resources, mm -hmm. and take the links. There are two links at the bottom, the five-minute read and the 30-minute read, and put those links in to distribute to everybody, because especially the second link, then they can read it. Also, my recommendation to everyone is share those links to your colleagues that can speak English. I realize there are, it's not in Spanish. And then ask them to read it and then meet with them and ask them, what did you learn? Yeah. What issues and concerns do you have? And if they have, if your colleagues, your coworkers and management team have concerns, send them to Jorge and Jorge will send it to me and I'll answer back. Most of their concerns are misconceptions. Yeah. They have excuses. Oh, we don't do that here. It's too complicated. No, we've got to break through that barrier. Managers deserve better information. Well, what will be amazing is to have you in a, in a conversatory rather than a presentation. I think uh, uh, when you talk and you discuss different topics, you take a lot of advantage out of the brain of those participating in. Well, but thank you very much for sharing all, all your, uh, your knowledge and, uh, and uh, I, I'm pretty sure that everybody enjoyed it. Uh, and I guess uh, we'll see you in another uh, occasion. My privilege, uh, you uh -huh. know, we should all, all be proud. We are operations, research, and industrial engineering professionals. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, for sure. All right, Gary, have a good all one. Right. Thank you very much. All okay. right.